Good morning and welcome to the 23rd annual exhibit of hydrogen and fuel cell technologies. We've always been wondering when it's going to happen. When the hydrogen and fuel cell technologies are going to become um, uh, competitors for that big energy budget which is oil and gas of course and when we'll be, when we'll be able to phase out the fossil fuels. It's a process that's going to take us time, but there's been great steps made recently. Um, and to talk about some of these uh, ways of decarbonizing our environment um, and using fuels more effectively and creating more hydrogen, uh, I'll be talking to a specialist in the field. It's Dr. Oliver Borm, who's from Sunf uh, Sunfire. And we'll be talking about steam electrolysis and its transfer of renewable energy into the oil and gas sector. Please welcome with me Dr. Oliver Borm. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you very much. So first, of course, everyone would like to know something about the company itself, Sunfire. Could you tell us a, a bit about com uh, Sunfire? Well, Sunfire was founded in 2011, and we are now a core technology provider for the so-called solid oxide cell, mm -hmm. which uh, basically can be used either as fuel cell in order to uh, um, generate power and heat from natural gas, for example, or as solid uh, oxide electrolysis cell in order to transfer electricity and steam into hydrogen. Mm -hmm. uh, we've seen, of course, uh, solid oxide fuel cell technologies here. Um, have there been advance advancements um, or new applications discovered? And here I'm talking about the solid oxide fuel cell. We'll get to the electrolysis issue here. But have there been advancements or changes in the market for solid oxide fuel cells? Well, solid oxide fuel cells and, uh, is another, as you told, uh, is another product and uh, application, and we are also having products in our portfolio for solid oxide fuel cells. But um, our main um, advances is the so-called steam electrolysis, or the uh, where we are using the solid oxide cell as um, electrolysis cell. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, let's move on to the uh, uh, electrolysis issue. Um, yesterday I moderated a um, talk of 10 manufacturers um, uh, of solid oxide, of, of electrolysis uh, technologies, and uh, there seem to be uh, a lot of similarities and not a lot of differences. Certainly what I didn't hear though in all of these 10 products was the mention of waste heat and how that applies to um, the uh, efficiency, uh, the applicability of um, solid oxide uh, electrolysis. That's your specialty, isn't it? That's true. So our main difference compared to water electrolysis is that we are using steam as material in order to um, uh, generate hydrogen. And here we can uh, integrate waste heat below 200 degrees Celsius, which is avail typically available in industrial environments like chemical industries, refineries, steel works. Um, and uh, that means we can uh, evaporate uh, the liquid water to steam, but not with, uh, necessarily with electricity, but integrating waste heat, which, is, uh, which would be otherwise wasted to the atmosphere and no longer used. Now, what I find about, uh, so interesting about this technology is that um, uh, there's always a debate if you're creating renewable electricity, for instance, uh, solar or um, uh, wind turbines, um, you can debate about whether you can put it directly into the grid, whether you should uh, uh, create hydrogen and store that, whether you should methanize the hydrogen. All of those debates are questions of efficiency, um, but they don't address one fundamental issue, that is wasted energy. Um, so this technology, it's specifically targeting facilities that have heat available that is not being recuperated? That's true, yes. And it's also, um, it's, when we are talking about energy transition, it's, uh, two years ago it was on the energy transition, it was just an electricity uh, transition. That means we are just decarbonizing the electricity sector. And uh, especially in Germany we did uh, already a pretty good job. So we have an, a renewable electricity share of 30% mm -hmm. in the electricity sector. Mm -hmm. But uh, at all the uh, electricity sector and the energy consumption is only roughly 25%. Mm -hmm. The other uh, seven, uh, 75% um, uh, energy share is oil and gas mm -hmm. and we need uh, a large 
efforts in order also to decarbonize the oil and gas sector. And we did there something with biofuels or biogas, uh, but this is always still below uh, 10%. And you always come to the debate, uh, this is uh, this uh, food versus fuel debate. Mm -hmm. And we need an efficient uh, technology and also in order to transfer renewable power into renewable hydrocarbons. Mm -hmm. And the uh, steam electrolysis is uh, the, the key in order to, uh, um, to generate hydrogen. And hydrogen is always the building block for hydrocarbons mm -hmm. in the end. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, it's interesting. I, I find the, the category decarbonization to be um, um, difficult because it's used, I think, in various ways to describe what factually is happening here. Um, if you are recuperating waste heat um, and you describe that as decarbonization, um, why does that merit as decarbonization? Is it because you're uh, recovering heat generated by hydrocarbons? Is that how well, you break it down? <clears throat> in the end, um there are a lot. Of, there's a lot of uh, heat wasted in industrial environments, and this can typically, when the heat is available at a relatively low temperature, at 150, 160 degrees Celsius, typically uh, you cannot generate much out of out of them, and this is wasted to the atmosphere. And I even if this is um, this waste comes from a fossil process, chemical process before, nevertheless you are wasting just this heat to the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. But if you can recuperate this heat and can integrate that heat to an electrolysis technology, mm -hmm. then your efficiency is much higher, so typically 20% higher than um, major water electrolysis uh, technologies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That means you need less electricity and you always need to pay for the electricity in the future. Mm -hmm. uh It'd be interesting to describe that in terms of like the market potential for this. I think I'm getting two messages here. One is that um, uh, high temperature heat, recovering that is uh, easier to some extent uh, with previous technologies. If you have a thousand degrees, for example, um, this technology is geared towards literally um, the lower temperature range that hasn't been addressed because it didn't seem to be by comparison that significant perhaps, but what is the market potential for this technology? Um, where can it be set up? Where can it be operated? And uh, what do you see of, uh, for the future commercialization of this product um, as its potential? Well, at the moment, 90, 95% of the hydrogen um, is used in uh, chemical industries, refineries, and uh, steelworks. Mm -hmm. And all of the, uh, that hydrogen is produced out of natural gas. Mm -hmm. And you are, you are emitting 10 kilogram um, CO2 per one kilogram of hydrogen. Mm -hmm. And there's already a huge market potential just to decarbonize that fossil hydrogen with renewable hydrogen. Mm -hmm. For example, if you look at the refinery, a typical refinery has a huge uh, usage of 5 to 10 tons of hydrogen per hour. Mm -hmm. So, And uh, this hydrogen is needed for the desulfuration so that the fuel has no longer sulfur in it. Mm -hmm. And it would be nice if we could, um, if we could uh, use renewable hydrogen at the refinery, pr produce it at the refinery, use the waste heat out of the refinery, the renewable power out of the grid, and produce renewable hydrogen in the refinery. And there's at, uh, alone in Germany a market potential of one to three gigawatt of electrolysis um, in the 13 refineries. One to three gigawatts is, of course, a huge quantity. Uh, do you have any idea how, much, uh, how many gigawatts of hydrogen are being consumed? Or, or produced in Germany uh, currently? Any? Uh, the, uh, in electricity? Or um, uh, yeah, or in, in industrial applications. Do you have any idea of the, the current consumption of hydrogen? Uh, the, uh, the total current consum uh, consumption, I uh, only have the worldwide number, so this equals 2,000 terawatt hours. Mm -hmm. And 2,000 terawatt hours is more or less the uh, um, final energy consumption of Germany, okay. just to give you a picture. All right, so it is a large quantity. Um, uh, steam electrolysis produce hydrogen. You want to, you mentioned this in our prep talk, uh, produce locally and consume locally. Um, 
are you thinking of, so this is not something, you're not conceptualizing a network of hydrogen production um, and transporting the energy. You really want to stay close to where it's being uh, consumed. Absolutely, because you can get rid of all the hydrogen logistics. Mm -hmm. This is always ex uh, expensive. And uh, the large benefit of the uh, steam electrolysis is the uh, tightly integration um, of the waste heat, and therefore you have to produce the hydrogen mm -hmm. in an industrial environment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is an interesting talk for me, because this is the first time I've actually had um, a discussion about electrolysis where the, the core of the technology and the advantage of the technology is using a resource that is being, being wasted. It reminds me of the biogas debate, for example, but uh, where the benefit of the technology is precisely that um, the energy is otherwise not being recuperated um, and it goes into um, uh, something productive. You're recovering that. Um, what's, were there any specific challenges in designing this unit in order to get it operating on that temperature differential of like 200 degrees around there, was that? Uh, well, <clears throat> what we are doing um, in the unit itself is we are, uh, we are heating up the steam up uh, to the operating temperature and the operating temperature is at um, roughly 800 degrees Celsius mm -hmm. and there the, uh, um, the hydrogen is produced and then the internally this high temperature heat, heat is recuperated. Mm -hmm. So, and the steam electrolysis itself is also very flexible. So we can um, modulate the power from 100% down to 30% in a couple of seconds mm -hmm. and from um, we can also when there is no renewable power for a couple of hours in the grid we can keep uh, the system hot mm -hmm. and keep it in hot standby mm -hmm. and then after five minutes or something we are getting from hot standby to full power again. Mm -hmm. Okay and the stop start factor is is not an issue there. Um, uh, let's get to market potentials because ultimately you want to sell these devices. Um, is it uh, Do you foresee an easy entrance into the market? Are they already, um, um, uh, do you already have buyers in line? Well, uh, especially in the these hydrogen to refineries topic is a very um, is a very current topic. We are talking with all refineries in Germany, mm -hmm. but the problem is that the uh, political framework is not yet there, unfortunately, mm -hmm. and so there need some some obstacles need to be uh, overcome, mm -hmm. and uh, then uh, I uh, my feeling is that this will hopefully done in the next three or four years mm -hmm. and uh, then we have a uh, huge market potential for the uh, for the refineries when you say that there uh, the polit political climate we know that there's some uh, ways of definite defining what forms of energy use um, have specific benefits is there any reward offered right now to decarbonization in this form does the government, do the environmentalists recognize this as a technology that deserves to be um, appreciated and rewarded or um, aided <clears throat> as it goes towards the market? Well, I mean, the fuel um, producers need to uh, need to increase their GHG mitigation from 4% from nowadays to 6% in 2020. Mm -hmm. And uh, at some extent, this cannot be done only by biofuels. Mm -hmm. And also biofuels of, um, uh, of the, the first generation of biofuels need to be phased out mm -hmm. in, in after 2020. Mm -hmm. So you need to fill this gap. And you can do this uh, par partially with renewable hydrogen, mm -hmm. uh, but therefore it, it's needed that the renewable hydrogen is accounted for as raw material, and only then you can apply the so-called upstream emission reduction, which were um, where, which were um, in a new directive. And so, yeah. So there need there are some details and, and some obstacles, but then yes, um, if you look. Um, the the cost of biofuel nowadays, mm -hmm. and you account these costs to renewable hydrogen, then there's a strong incentive uh, to produce renewable hydrogen. Mm -hmm. okay. I should add, if there's que questions from the audience, uh, just raise your hand and uh, we'll attempt to address them. When we were preparing this talk, and of course when I was reading the brochure of uh, Sunfire, 
uh, which has a very broad spectrum. We're focusing on solid oxide electrolysis, but uh, they're specialists in solid oxide fuel cells as well. And uh, one of the units that struck my attention, I know I'm not supposed to ask this question because um, its relevance to your larger business model, which is of course this wonderful device that uses waste energy to create hydrogen, um, uh, that's the important thing. But still, I can't resist. Uh, it's the first time I've seen a, a commercializable, reversible fuel cell. That is, you convert energy to uh, electric hydrogen, and then you can go backwards in the same unit. Okay. Absolutely. Uh, so our stacks are, can be operated either as fuel cell or as an electrolysis or um, in a re reversible mode. The stack itself doesn't even know when it's produced if it's used as fuel cell or as electrolysis or as a reversible stack. Mm -hmm. um, this is the the large uh, advantage and benefit of our of our technology. And yes, we we uh, we, are, we have produced a couple of re reversible systems uh, which are working uh, exactly exactly the way as you have described and the, um, the benefit of uh, storing electricity in terms of hydrogen is that the storage of um, uh, hydrogen is very cheap so you pay roughly 10 to 20 um, Euro, uh, euros per kilowatt hour uh, compared to batteries for batteries you you, you need to um, you, uh, you have investment costs of 600 to 800 euros per kilowatt hour mm -hmm. and after some extent so if you have uh, um, yeah, if you have uh, we call it dark doldrums in Germany if you have no wind and no sun for two to four days available mm -hmm. um, and you need uh, nevertheless a reliable um, energy um, con uh, production mm -hmm. then it's more efficient to uh, to have a reversible system and store the electricity in terms of hydrogen mm -hmm. It's, it's, uh, the, the principle of reversibility is clear, but I've never seen a unit that does both, that's designed to do both. Um, it's a wonderful thing for a remote application, I'm sure. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> if you have no electricity grid available um, and you avoid the transportation of log uh, logistic fuel, mm -hmm. like diesel or something else, then it's even more cheaper to, uh, to be 100% um, run on renewable power. A fascinating device. I encourage everyone to go to the stand of Sunfire, which is E51 over there. Um, the complexities of these issues are uh, really large, and I've simplified this to uh, waste heat uh, simply because I've never seen um, electrolysis technology that allows us to recuperate that in a way that is vital to the uh, energy economy. Um, and I think that among the 10 electrolyzer manufacturers that I talked to yesterday, um, this category didn't even turn up. I think it's a fundamental advancement. Um, and it's worth talking to uh, Sunfire in detail. So do visit their booth, which is E51 there. Um, Dr. Oliver Borm, it's been a pleasure talking to you. I hope I'll see you back here next year. Um, and I hope the marketing of this wonderful technology goes well. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And thank you. Uh, we will be continuing in very few minutes with um, uh, Doug Richmond, who's from RICS, and they'll be talking about the importance of volumetric flow. So stay tuned. Um, have a drink there on the house.